All right, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist working on SMAP. And today's uh, webinar will be focused on the applications of remote sensing to soil moisture and uh, ET. And so uh, we have a uh, guest speaker today. Her name is Vanessa Escobar. And Vanessa is the Missions Applications Coordinator for SMAP. And she will uh, give us an overview of some of the applications that are using uh, soil moisture from SMAP. And I'll just uh, leave it up to you, uh, Vanessa. Please take it on. Great. Thank you. And do you want me to advance my own slides, Erica? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, well, hello to everybody, and uh, and thank you for dialing in. Like Erica said, this is um, SMAP application. So the uses of soil moisture data, particularly the uses of SMAP data. Um, I started off with uh, with a nice image from the International Space Station, just so um, we have a reminder for this talk on how science is really intended to serve our understanding of the Earth and the millions of people that, you know, science does serve and the need to communicate the uses of the science and, and the different ways we have to communicate it. So um, we do this through a number of our satellite missions. And as Erica mentioned, I belong to applications. So as the um, applications coordinator for SMAP, my, my main role is to make sure that the data coming off from SMAP measuring soil moisture is translated in such a way that end users, whether they're sophisticated scientists looking at unique applications in um, you know, deeper science questions, or if they're commercial users looking to maybe get an edge on, um, on their businesses, equally that all users have an understanding of what the impact um, and also the limitations of um, some of these data are. So um, what I'm going to go over for my talk is really um, intended to be in, in that breath and to talk about the uses. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background for NASA Applied Sciences and, and the mission overview. I know um, your first session with our set really went into SMAP mission. Um, so I'll just touch on a few things, get into applications, and then um, really get to the crux of what early adopters are, what that program means to applications and the uses of soil moisture give you a few samples of SMAP data applications, and then hopefully leave some time for some question and answers and, um, and discussion. So, um, so here, and apologies for the, for the low res if it, if it seems fuzzy to some of you. Um, here you have the Earth Science Missions and Instruments from NASA writ large, and you can see that we have a lot of things, you know, going around in space. And um, this slide really represents um, a number of, of satellites. We have the satellites that are currently in orbit. We have those that are projected to be in orbit, and then um, those that have follow-on. And if you can see in green in the most outer section, you see SMAP is sitting there with SUMI-NCP, Landsat-8, and GPM. And those are our most recently launched decadal survey missions, which have really empowered, um, being part of the decadal survey, um, empowers applications and the capabilities for using science and integrating user feedback into mission product design. And that's really what we're going to talk about um, today. So, um, you know, the basic question is why should we measure soil moisture? And um, soil moisture has really been a limiting factor in a lot of applications, uh, particularly agriculture productivity um, in all parts around the world. Soil moisture is measured on the ground. Um, in data poor regions and measuring soil moisture from a satellite really gives us an amazing opportunity to have continuous and constant observation globally. So not only can we calibrate it with the existing ground data that we have, especially in data rich regions like North America, but we can provide um, perspective to data poor regions and provide um, a data gap to areas that don't have a lot of ground measurements. Um, soil moisture has a huge impact on evaporation, and um, you know it's it's just a very important um, variable when it comes to not just the sensible heat and latent heat, but it also has a huge role in understanding water cycle, carbon cycle, and the energy cycle. So dynamic global vegetation models, um, flux models, carbon budgets, they all depend on soil moisture and root zone to to give um, more accurate values and answers for their outputs. So when we look at 
soil moisture. And when we look at microwave, we, um, we want to understand why we are using microwave remote sensing. And there's a really, a, just a very strong distinction between wet and dry. And you can see in the image we have a wet, uh, a wet soil, which is less reflective, and a dry soil, which is, um, which is more reflective. Now, um, I'm not going to get into this too much, but when we look at the microwave uh, brightness temperature, the reason we use microwave is that we have a very strong dielectric constant between dry soil and wet soil. Um, dry soil has a dielectric constant of around 4, and wet soil has a dielectric constant of around 80. So there's a large distinction between the two, and the contrast allows us to understand when something is wet or dry with microwaves. Also, with microwaves, you can see through clouds. So when you're having an event, um, a hurricane or rain, we actually have the capability to see through the clouds and be able to tell if, um, you know, if something is, is wet or dry. So emissivity, for those of you who don't know, is the capability of the soil um, or any kind of material on the ground to emit um, energy in, in terms of thermal, um, thermal radiation. And so when you have a black body, and a black object, that's a perfect emitter. And emissivity re really stems from there. So when we know the soil dielectric constant, um, we can use a standard relationship to calculate the soil moisture. This map has a very specific incident angle. So we take the look angle, we take the polarization of the radiation and the dielectric constant to give us our, um, our brightness temperature. And that's what we use to calculate our soil moisture in, um, in the equations for all of the products that you're going to see from SMAP. So. So then, um, January, January 2015, we were able to um, satisfy the decadal survey as the first um, mission to launch um, for the new decadal survey, and, um, and to satisfy the need for measuring soil moisture globally using both passive and active through, um, through microwave remote sensing on SMAP. And SMAP would potentially provide a continuing record to soil moisture observations through, um, through remote sensing and a follow-on to the European mission um, known as SMOS, the Soil Moisture Ocean Salinity Mission. Um, but it would also add the high-resolution uh, capabilities by adding radar. So um, SMAP's unique nature was to have a, a passive radiometer and an active radar uh, combined on the satellite. Uh, let's see my next slide. For some reason, it isn't showing. Let me see. There we go. Okay. So, like I said earlier, um, SMAP's role is to really help us understand the connection between terrestrial water, the water cycle, um, what role it plays in agriculture and weather, um, energy exchange, how that works at the land surface and fluxes, and then really tie that into understanding the carbon cycle. Um, SMAP has very specific scientific goals. Each mission from NASA is required to have very, um, very clear scientific objectives, and 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 so SMAP specifically is um, has promised to link water, energy, and carbon through the estimation of global um, global surface water and land fluxes and energy fluxes. Its um, its use of microwave data for soil moisture um, observations is going to quantify net carbon fluxes in boreal landscapes and reduce the uncertainty of climate model projections. And it's doing that through, um, through the use of, of L-band, which, um, which is that microwave frequency that's really going to allow us not just to penetrate through clouds, but to also see deeper, um, deeper into the soil. Uh, SMOS has a penetration of, of about 1 to 3 centimeters using C-band. And by using L-band, we've increased that penetration down to about 5 centimeters. So there's also an applications return. And by using the science, what we mean by applications return is we're going to have a benefit. We're going to have enhanced weather forecast. And we're going to um, be able to improve, improve the flood prediction and drought monitoring through the design of SMAP. And what SMAP is doing um, is it changed its design from what SMOS had originally done. And it has a conical scan. And I have an image of this later on. And a large antenna, which has a 1,000 kilometer swath, which has a very ample coverage, which allows us to get um, global measurements in, um, in two to three days as opposed to um, longer periods. So um, definitely an improvement. And so we have SMAP um, measurement approach 
um, which I said we have the radar, which is the L-band that was providing the high resolution and the freeze thaw. The radiometer, also L-band, which is providing the moderate resolution but the high accuracy. And I think you may have covered this on the last webinar you guys had. Um, they both share the same antenna, uh, which gives you that wide scan, that wide swath at 40 degrees. Um, we have a sun-synchronous orbit, and the mission is, um, technically all missions are designed to operate for three years, um, but we have enough fuel for five. And if it's anything like MODIS and continues to um, operate um, as well as it has been operating, then you know we, we do have the capability of seeing beyond five years, which is always a bonus. Um, but uh, as, as many of you know now, on July 7th, the SMAP radar did stop transmitting uh, due to a power uh, supply problem. And uh, the radar subsystem is no longer operable. We are moving forward with the radiometer as it continues to, um, to perform above expectations, which is wonderful. And, um, and your science that you're going to see is going to come from the radiometer, um, some of the historical radar data, and then also um, you'll see improvements on what we're doing with the radiometer to, and the substitutions for the, um, for the loss of the radar. So um, knowing that we had radar, um, we had a year of data and the radiometer, we do have some lessons learned that we were able to collect um, from you know, our, our predecessor, SMOS, which is still in operations, and now from SMAP. And we've been able to improve um, substantially uh, on radio frequency interferences that we learned SMOS had from the design, and we've been able to improve on that from SMAP. SMAP is able to test the high resolution and high accuracy combination using not just L-band, but the radar radiometer combo. And um, like I said earlier, we have deeper penetration into soils. We also have better sensing over vegetated areas, increasing the amount of vegetation per grid cell um, that you can have and being able to see through, uh, through the canopy. And so, um, let's see, working with SMOS. So working with SMOS, we've um, not only improved our design, but we're also looking forward to how SMAP applications will, um, will move beyond this mission and what we need to do down the road. And the best use of that information really is provided by, um, by our users, which we'll talk about here shortly. So just quickly from the satellite perspective, where we sit is um, we launched in 2015. We have data acquisitions um, that started in April, so there's plenty of data. Um, there's a year's worth of data from radar, and there's continuous data from the radiometer. Um, due to the malfunction, we've been looking at ways to enhance um, the SMAP mission, high resolution um, promise to the mission, but we do have um, beta products that are going to be released here in October for enhancement, and that would be of interest to, to people looking um, for high resolution in applications. And um, as far as the validated products from SMAP, those are, have been available as of um, April 30th. So all of the information is, is ready and freely available, and if any of you have used it or plan to use it. Um, applications is one of the components from the mission that is always interested in understanding how you're using the data and what your applications are. So um, you may have seen this on your previous um, webinar of the products that were available. These are actually the existing products that we're going to have with, um, with this map radar um, no longer in, um, in operation. And we also have enhanced products. And what I mean by that is that there are going to be um, several research efforts to recover the high resolution capabilities. One of them is enhancing um, the radiometer. And the other one is ingesting um, data from Sentinel-1, A and 1B. So when we're saying a, a radiometer image that looks like this from May 15, um, we will enhance it using specific methodology to look more like this. And um, you'll actually hear about the details and the algorithms that are going to be applied for this to happen. But this simple enhancement and sharpening of the image itself is opening the doors for, um, for a number of our appli application users. And um, it's bringing um, increased value to, um, to the research that's going on with SMAP. So um, all very positive and looking down the road. And then this is just a, a product suite and a list of what you're going to be uh, provided, and you can just keep this for, for future discussion. 
um, once the enhanced products are out, and those will be publicly publicly released um, come December for um, for all of you to experiment with and uh, and provide some feedback on. So, in terms of the enhanced uh, products, they're they're really well, they're not already released, but they are mission to mission requirements, and they will be released in December. We we just recently updated that, um, and we have a year's worth of of products. Um, that will be fed into that. So um, we're very eager to hear how, um, how all of this fits. And in terms of where you can find the data quite quickly, um, you can go to the data centers, NSIBC or the ASF will host this fantastically. Both DACs are, um, are interconnected and they are, if you are looking for products that may sit at ASF, which was usually radar, that are now at NSIBC, you can link to either and they will direct you um, to you know, to each, so you can find the products seamlessly. Um, the DACs have also worked with applications quite closely to create visualization tools that are helpful to um, all types of users and to different ways of finding data and making data, um, you know, just easier to understand and um, easier to ingest and to apply. And so, if you're used to searching uh, geographically, then you can use their visualization uh, map through SMAP data, or um, you can do a search by product. They have a, a variety of options, and this has mainly been due to uh, the feedback from the applications community. So the feedback that you provide does apply directly to how SMAP um, organizes its data and how it distributes its products. And so they have a number of data services, they have a number of tools. Um, you can actually download the product in its native format, which is HDF5, or you can um, change it on the fly to geotiffs or KMVs, which depending on what your uses are, might be more, um, might be more beneficial. So um, that is really enough background on SMAP and, um, and the instrument itself. And what I really want to get into now are the, um, are the applications. And in terms of applications, we have, you know, we have different meanings. And I say applications and people sometimes think of phone apps or they think of different type models. And so really at the end of the day, I think applications mean something totally different than another person. And, um, and the caption as it reads, you know, it's just, I don't think it means what you think it means and it's so important to make sure that it's defined um, def and defined clearly. Because when we talk about NASA developing science and developing applications, we usually see, or I've, I've been informed <laughs> that we have the user community on one side, and then on the other side, we have the developer working vigorously to create fantastic science products that he and his soul really believes is going to solve a problem and answer a question. However, the question from the science data developer and the, the need from the user community isn't normally bridged. And so what we try to do with applications is really bridge that gap and how SNAP does this is with the applications program through feedback mechanisms in the user community, through engagement strategies, and, um, and through the early adopter program where we seek to make data easier to find, more familiar, and easier to use. And when I talk about uses, the outcome of that gap and the use um, can be that it's just not user friendly, and that's where we started. HDF5 was not the easiest format and was not the most user-friendly um, format for, uh, for people and for SMAP. And we had a violent feedback um, for how, how difficult it was for some people to use. And one of the biggest impacts SMAP has had is that it has gone all the way up to um, the higher leadership in NASA where KMZs are now an official format for, for NASA data. And that was due to um, SMAP, SMAP early adopter and um, user community feedback. So um, really the, the applications look at the issues from users versus science. And the National Research Council recommended that applications be formally implemented into the mission structure. Um, like I said earlier, SMAP is the first mission to do this. And it's, it's looking at not just the, the mandatory incorporation of application into the mission plan, 
but it's also become a critical component of, of the mission structure. And the science team relies on the feedback of the community to really understand what is and what is not working in terms of the data and how can the data be improved. Um, and, and the fact that we bake it into the, um, the mission program has really made um, a significant difference to how quickly we release different type products and even test it out through our user community, um, such as the early adopters. So like I said earlier, defining applications is very important. And how we define applications within NASA and within the mission is that um, applications are um, an innovative use of the data products, but they also support decision-making activities that have a um, direct link to a societal benefit. And that's usually the hook and, and the hardest part to, um, to satisfy. Um, it's, you know, it's usually one or the other. You have an application that has a you know, very good scientific value, but to bridge it to the end user who has a societal benefit sample um, is, is a challenge. So when we do our applied research, we, we apply and provide the fundamental knowledge for the data, but we make sure that there's user policy or business management activities incorporated and have a potential to have improvement on the decision structures from the use of that um, applied research. And the user communities are, are inclusive. I mean, they, they go with individuals or groups, public or private sector, and they, they span um, global scales of decision making down to local, and we look at national and international um, organizations and partners um, as far as the information that we seek to, to improve upon or just feedback that we, we search for. Now, assessing this map community was one of the first things we needed to do, and looking at that gap and trying to understand what was um, what was SMAP really like. When we first started SMAP applications back in 2009, we had about 200 people interested in using SMAP data. And um, since then, presently, we have almost 700 people as part of the user community. So in terms of the... Um, the survey, we conducted a survey in 2012 to really break down the community and understand who was doing what, what applications were well, well represented, and were there any gaps in, um, in information. And what the results revealed was that there were gaps between research and policy applications, um, which was expected. Um, there, was a, there was a high perceived value of, of soil moisture, but we didn't have quantitative values yet. There was just a perception. And there was an uncertainty as to how the ground observations would really scale to the remote sensing data. So it, that gave us an avenue of, um, you know, of explanation and, and teaching and education. And then, of course, where to access SMAP-like data. When the satellite hadn't launched yet, we wanted people to use proxies. And we really need to give, um, we needed to give people direction on where to find it and even the ground data, how to access that. And, and give them a hand in that. So, um, was very useful to us, was to understand the distribution of users within our community. And what we learned was um, when we asked responders to first identify, to self-identify, we had 98% of them identify as science data users. But when we asked that category to be broken down further, we had um, a clear break. You can see that the science and research mainly stuck to weather, climate, agriculture, forestry, and water resources. And then another group, um, you know, another cluster essentially identified under hazards, disasters, floods, and then in other category. And the other category is really made up of risk assessments and forest fire, um, uh, the community, that community. So these categories are grossly underrepresented. And what we wanted to do from the survey was really understand why, because we listed our first action as let's increase communication with hazards, disasters, and floods, and fire, but then increasing communication isn't necessarily enough. We really needed to understand why that community was, um, was not well represented. And so when we moved into another part of the survey, um, which involved policymaking, public awareness, um, and we asked responders to really identify in that category, 80% of the population responded that their involvement was mainly research driven. And 60% of the respondents um, conducting research claimed that they were not actively involved, if involved at all, 
in any policymaking effort. Um, so we found this to be a very important gap um, because those involved in research feel that they're, you know, they're not involved with connecting to policy bodies. And in order to make these, these science products more known to users in hazards and um, emergency management, it does have to move out of the scientific realm. So the, section, the second action that we um, created for this program was to really facilitate the movement of science into policy, and that's where the translation really kicked off. Through our work in applications um, for the SNAP mission, we can help move research into the appropriate um, operational audiences, and that in itself starts to identify what are the limitations, what are the requirements that we have to address, and what are the user needs. Not so much how does science um, satisfy the community, but how can the community take up science in a world where we everyone has limitations? There's resource limitations, there's limitations on time. And so we had to be cognizant of um, you know theoretical limits as well as um, you know realistic limits. And so the applications for SNAP are broad. We have you've heard about um, the weather applications, which is one of the core applications for SNAP. We have applications in agriculture productivity, um, flood management, flood response, and flood preparedness. There's also um, drought, and that covers everything from agriculture drought to, um, to climate drought, and then that also starts to bleed into um, famine and early warning systems. When you look at early warning, we look at health, and we look at how does health and soil moisture um, how do they relate to each other? And how can things like um, dengue and West Nile virus you know, benefit? How can, how can soil moisture help those particular models that help us look at the, um, the risks of, of those diseases? How can it help us understand that a little bit better? And then we get into national security. How can our military um, understand routes of opportunity and prevention from getting stuck and improve mobility by using soil moisture data in areas there that are you know lacking in ground observations and then you of course have the less popular applications that people don't naturally think about when you hear a the name of the mission soil moisture um, active passive you don't naturally think of using the soil moisture um, observations from snap or the the brightness temperatures from SNAP to look at sea surface winds. Um, and that's actually a study being done by, um, by NOAA. Or look at, the sea, um, look at the SNAP observations to understand thicknesses in ice and try to detect the difference between single year ice and multi year ice. That is critically important for ships moving through the Arctic and have, um, and have you know, risk of piercing a hole if they were to strike multi-year ice. And then, of course, we have fires um, that are critically important and just go without say on, on the applications and what the value of that would be. And, um, and storm damage. You know, you're going to hear, um, I'm going to give you a sample from one of our early adopters as to, you know, what is the, how does SNAP help, um, help predict power outages? And those, again, are are applications that the mission right off the bat didn't think about when um, we put together an applications program. But through our communication with early adopters, these were brought to light and they've turned out to be some of um, the more exciting applications for the mission. All of them are great, but um, when you get you know new discoveries, you can't help but jump up and down, or at least I can't. So, um, and, and all of this is really brought about by our early adopter program. And our early adopters are, um, are really just a subset of the mission user community. Um, they are very specific users. They are volunteers um, that really link the early adopter, um, they, they link the SNAP data to an application, to a benefit of a society. And so what we do is we team up a science team member to an early adopter. And um, through their collective work, we, well, they guide um, and provide feedback on the uses of the product and the SNAP science team member really benefits from a broader understanding of how it's applied and some of the um, sometimes technical and oftentimes less technical 
um, uses of the data that they as a science team member would not necessarily be aware of. So there's a deeper understanding um, with, with the early adopters involved. And now this was embedded into the mission program a couple of years before we launched to get them familiar with format, to get them familiar with the mission um, product structure, and really get them um, up to speed with what SNAP data would look like. We gave them proxies, we gave them sample, we gave them CalVal, gave them everything we could um, to, to help them, to give them a leg up on the use of SNAP data. And what they've done post-launch is the early adopters have really just projected and pushed forward into multiple applications with the use of SNAP data. So through them and by engaging with them early on, they've accelerated um, the use and the applications of SNAP. Um, those originally intended by the project and others, um, like I said, in sea ice and, and power outages that we really did not expect to, uh, to see. And so the early adopters are, um, are really distributed worldwide. You can see we have a lot in North America um, we, um, we are always looking for, for more partners, um, even though they wouldn't be early adopters, we would still consider them applied users. And, you know, so research in, in South America, we have some partners in Europe and in Africa. Uh, we have a couple in Australia. There's only one shown there, but we have, I believe we have two now. And so, um, this is just a simulated image of the, of the SMAP radar. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to show where our, our distribution of our early adopters were in relation to that. And, um, and this is actually the logo of all of our early adopters. So we engage with communities um, worldwide and we have over 48, I'm, I'm trying to think how many um, university users. So we have 52. We have 52 early adopters at, the, at this time. But, um, you know, university commercial, you can see John Deere was one of our partners at one point, Lockheed Martin. Is, uh, is still an existing partner. We have Google on board. Um, and then we have some of the NASA centers. We have Sport over at Marshall. Um, we have a lot of the agriculture groups like NAS, and we have the USGS. And so there's, um, there's, a, there's a broad spectrum here. And the goal is really to have research and decision support operations covered nicely. We have um, software groups like Excellus creating tools. So it's it's intended to use the observations for science operations and um, and decision support tools for the future. And the uh, these next slides really just show you just some of the some of the early adopter partners. Um, and like I said, we have the NASA Snow and Ice um, Center down on the right hand corner. That's the DAC. And then we have the Short Term Prediction Research and Transition Group um, up on the left hand um, top left which is sport. And they're working on assimilating soil moisture observations into real time, high resolution land surface models. Um, whereas the DAC, it is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a user um, facilitator for improving not just the format, but improving on where you find data and, um, and how it, you access it. So some of the early adopters, um, as I mentioned earlier, are, um, you know, are, are very actively involved. And what I did was, I pulled together just some um, some advocacy quotes and just to quote exactly what they're doing, and so you understand, you know, from from their own perspective. We put together a video some time ago, um, which you can see at the bottom, and um, we also have a a journal of hydrometeorology where most of their papers are uh, submitted, where they um, where they're taking soil moisture and what they're doing with it. And for example, the Army is. Um, looking at soil moisture and mobility and really understanding um, not just water security, but, but soldier safety. Um, and then you have the National Drought Mitigation Center, which is a huge organization, and looking at these data at the higher resolution originally and now looking at the radiometer to cover, um, to cover the entire country. And so they actually work with analysts. And this is, this is an ongoing system where you know, this is updated on a regular basis. Then you have um, NOAA looking at soil moisture applications to improve weather forecasts. And then you have NAS, which is really looking at the potential for saving money um, and looking at soil moisture measurements for agriculture uh, at a county scale. And I'll, and I'll show you what they're doing um, here in a couple of slides. We have Columbia University. 
um, looking at the livelihoods and um, rural populations that are looking at the vulnerability of drought and floods. And then we have uh, commercial companies like AER um, using SMAP data to look at the details of flooding events, specifically flash floods. And um, our group up in New York at the City uh, University of New York is looking at water quality. Um, they're working actually with water managers to understand how soil moisture data helps them understand um, water quality for the city of New York a little better. And again, um, if the, at the bottom, if you copy down that link, you can both see the video and read the publications of all of the early adopters and, uh, and get a little bit more background on their stories. Um, obviously, you can't be covered in a one hour webinar. So um, moving forward, we have various categories that are covered and we have five early adopters looking at weather forecasting nine in drought, seven in flood, one in carbon, three in national security, which includes army mobility and sea ice. Um, excuse me, those are just army mobility. I broke out sea ice into five other um, early adopters. We have five early adopters looking at human health, 11 in agriculture productivity, and then we have six creating decision and communication support tools. So um, if any of you are interested in, again, getting more details on each of these early adopters, I'm more than happy to provide that um, after the webinar. It's, it, there's a lot of information here. Um, but the, again, it's just emphasized the opportunities um, that these early adopters give and, um, and the relationship that we've had with them pre-launch and now into post-launch and the process where um, you know, it's, it's all been new. This is all benchmarking where by providing them proxy data and sample data, and now by communicating with them on the uses of the information, we're only a year and a half after launch, and we have quantitative results for a lot of their work. And the next few slides are going to give you some examples of the work that the early adopters are doing. And um, closest to my heart is flooding, so I start with that application since I'm, I'm involved in this quite heavily myself with my own research. And um, Flooding is, um, is one of these fantastically broad applications where you can apply SMAP data. And SMAP is um, being used to look at both global flooding and local flooding. And the applications um, for flooding scale from the reinsurance industry to, uh, to NOAA to, uh, to, to local users, for example, the state of Maryland, um, where the Soil moisture observations are being used to understand how saturated the soil is and what is the risk of flood um, to a particular area. The reinsurance obviously wants to understand this because it, there's a difference between insurance, which is your local state farm in all state, and then your reinsurers. And those are the insurance companies that insure the insurance companies. So this is kind of an umbrella. So the reinsurers um, covers the risk and it shares, it distributes the um, the burden of, of a storm or of, a, of an incident. So for example, when Sandy hit, you had several reinsurance companies share the burden across the membership they have at the highest level, which is through the Lords of London. And so we communicate the benefits of soil moisture to the Lords of London and to the reinsurance. So they have an awareness and an understanding that by using soil moisture, you can put it into modeling and um, they use global models that evaluate the soil and look at the saturation levels and then evaluate risk. Um, their actuaries um, will evaluate the risk of a particular area and see if a storm would potentially cause, um, cause losses. And that's not losses of life, but that's losses of property. So they look at it from a monetary standpoint. Um, also using the, the SMAP data, you can evaluate um, the runoff of models, both river floods and um, and precipitation flooding. So evaluating the scenarios, um, both at a county scale and a state scale, are very important. And we have NOAA uh, doing that. And we also have one of our early adopters, uh, which is known as Storm Center, using a tool that simply layers soil moisture data as a KMZ. It's not evaluating or taking an assessment of the data itself, but using it as a layer for situational awareness. So you have a, a broad a broad use of the data, whether it's going into assimilating um, different values, whether it's looking at the evaluation of the, the soil moisture and assessing a risk and giving you a risk factor, um, looking at 
the soil moisture as a as a tool for situational awareness, flood is a an incredibly popular tool um, for uh, for soil moisture and for SNAP. Now, how we've improved the communication um, and how we seek to improve the communication since the loss of the radar. Most of those early adopters that I mentioned were all involved with the um, high resolution product. Um, the enhancement is going to facilitate um, a better discussion. The, um, the population that is interested in flood um, unfortunately had to uh, wait a little bit and stall for, um, for the radar. But this high resolution image, which is um, an enhancement from the radiometer, which you see to the left, that is a nine kilometer um, enhanced visual image um, using Bacchus Gilbert, and that, which, you'll, which you'll learn about in the next webinar and then improving the spatial resolution um, potentially to about 25 kilometers. That right there opens the door for flooding again, and it really enables um, the Civil Protection in Italy, Storm Center, Google, um, the University of New Hampshire, Willis Reinsurance, and the World Food Program all to continue research and applications in flood. And what, um, what I was doing uh, just previous to this webinar was um, a couple of weeks previous to this webinar was working with FEMA and trying to really understand in terms of flood and in terms of SNAP data, there's a decision process and a, and a data timeline where flood managers and risk assessment people um, within the flood industry use data. And so right now what we're doing in applications is mapping out where does SNAP fit in the decision timeline of flood management, and where does the uncertainty and the accuracy really trade off? How important is timely information versus accurate information? And at what point um, in the decision process do you start providing information more quickly and start worrying less about the resolution? And so that's actively going on right now, and, and we're communicating with FEMA and through our early adopters, getting a better understanding as to um, where SNAP data fit best. And so this is an ongoing learning process. So one of our early adopters um, in flooding that is enormously advanced is uh, Luca Broca out of Italy. And he is a SNAP in flooding operations in central Italy. And he is now the passive, was interested in radar and um, obviously has adapted to the passive to get real-time acquisitions of soil moisture over Italy. And he validates his real-time assessment with, um, with ground networks. And this is, you know, directly with, um, with the communication of the civil protection group and the flood managers. So he puts the data into a national scale flood warning system, and he looks at flood and he looks at landslide potential and landslide risk. And his real-time assimilation of SNAP data into this operating system feeds into the Central Italy um, decision process. So. The validation with ground data um, based soil moisture observations are um, something that Luca is very fluent in. He's had three publications, which I'm happy to send to anybody who's interested or provide it to, um, to the RSET hosts. Um, Brock, I'm happy to send it to you and you can share it around. But, um, but Luca's use of SNAP data in flood operations in Italy is, um, is just really unique. He's simply just waiting on funding and he will be, um, he will be one of the first users where SNAP is both scientifically, quantitatively valuable, and also societal obvious benefit to um, to the Operation Flood Alert map that he's provided. So he's he's actually one of our um, really great examples. Um, another use of SNAP data and flooding I mentioned earlier when we were looking at the general applications is prediction of power outages. And what um, Steve Queering has done is. Um, we were waiting for storms early on, and unfortunately, we didn't have any storms <laughs> for him to look at. So he did, um, he looked at historical storms and he applied SNAP data to the field areas where Sandy hit. And um, what he did was run a scenario and he used modeled soil moisture, which was calculated, and then he used soil moisture observations from SNAP. And he ran the scenarios, basically a data denial, to understand had Sandy passed through. Um, at that time, and had we used SMAP soil moisture, we would would we have known, um, would we have any better information on how many people would have been affected with power outages? 
And it turns out that we would have learned more people were affected with power outages um, using soil moisture data than the calculated soil moisture from the walk, from the models. So um, our update now is to find out if um, he was able to apply this algorithm and uh, look at the SMAP data um, post Florida storm and uh, and find out you know how many people were actually affected um, based on his prediction and the actual outages um, using SMAP data. So. Again, ongoing operational research that, um, given uh, you know, give, given our area and the sensitivity we have to power outages and the derechos and everything that we've had out here on the East Coast, um, I would really love to know if I'm at risk for power outage because I would plan for a hotel farther away <laughs> much quicker. <laughs> uh, spending spending seven to ten days with no power is never fun. So, um, fantastic research and, like I said, ongoing with um, with Steve Cleary and his team. Another application we talked about was drought, um, and I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit so we have some time for questions. So USGS is um, looking at a new soil moisture um, promise for understanding um, the drought that's dominated really by grasslands and shrublands. So validation of SMAP um, soil moisture data and in situ is really being used to estimate um, high levels of high and low levels of, of drought capabilities and, and potential. And so what they've done is they have taken a study area and study areas are dominated by grasslands and they, um, the stars on the charts represent the locations in the U.S. Um, for the U.S. Climate uh, Reference Network, which is soil moisture sites in the U.S. And then the background is a sample image of the average soil moisture for the field summarized. So the validation of the SMAP data um, versus the observed um, soil moisture is um, is very much in agreement, and the comparison of the SMAP soil moisture against the in situ made um, made the difference soil difference in soil depth. Um, they were they're shaded, and they are the ones that are actually showing the agreement. And you can see that they correlate both in Texas, the Palestine area, the Austin area. And it just really presents a strong argument for the use of, um, of soil moisture in these areas and helping us with, um, with drought monitoring. Now, this is obviously going to the USGS. We also have the, um, the US Drought Monitor, which is looking at it. Um, different ways of applying and actually using the data, given um, the internal processes. But again, the agreement of the SMAP data with the ground data is just such a strong and, and valuable argument for, um, for using the data operationally. And that really brings us to um, something supported by USAID called FUSENET, the Famine Early Warning System. Now FUSENET, um, their objective is to incorporate remote sensing soil moisture into the Famine Early Warning System. Um, and it's to quantify the benefits of, of microwave. This is their agreement with us. They want to help us understand the benefits of, of SMAP data. And um, really, we're conducting experiments with them to test and assess the impact of SMAP um, in their area. Right now, what they do is they focus on a precipitation um, model to, to see whether or not the soil moisture values that they extract from their model agree with the ground observations. And they also, they also have a very data poor region. So what they're testing is to see, does SMAP agree with their model output? And this is actually a very political process. Um, for FUSENET to use information, um, it's, it's more than just being right or wrong. FUSENET has to be 100% certain of what they put into their drought reports um, because it could potentially give false information for, for famine. And so what they do, what they seek to do is seek ways of incorporating data to give a better famine prediction. And because it involves human lives, it requires a lot of, a lot of assessment and analysis. And so SMAP right now is, um, is being introduced and it is in agreement with what their models are saying. And so now it's a matter of presenting different scenarios and presenting a timeline to the analysts so they are certain and they have a high confidence rate that by using SMAP, no, no harm comes to anybody um, through predicting uh, famine. So very much a scientific process in terms of um, showing the value of SMAP, but also um, a, an internal uh, process for making sure that the livelihood of people are not threatened. Um, in Barcelona, we have an early adopter using um, SMAP for fire risk. She works directly with the, um, the Forest Service, 
and she's integrated their map into her system and applies um, risk levels, which is exactly how the Forest Service works, low, moderate, high, very high, and extreme. And that is, um, that is being used out in Barcelona for, um, for all of Spain. And quickly, our decision support tools, we have a couple of early adopters that I'll just go over quickly. Um, we have, I mentioned um, USDA, the crop condition report through NAS, the National Agriculture Statistics Service. And what they've developed, um, I'll let you guys take a look on, on the web when you have some time, is, um, is an application called VegScape. What you have online right now is, is, not the, um, is not the full version that they're developing. But what they've done is they've added soil moisture and root zone soil moisture to a tool that actually provides statistics for your soil moisture at different depths by county. And that's really important, um, not just for the agricultural purpose and your productivity, and anything that has to do with agricultural risk, but it also has to do with the state and how states work and the decisions that are made at the county scales and allowing the county not only to have an understanding of agriculture productivity, agriculture um, uh, predictions, but also um, look at the carbon footprint and being able to understand water resource management. So their application of SMAP data really stems beyond that of agriculture. And then you have um, vehicle mobility, which is Lockheed Martin. The two images you see, you have four squares on top and four images on the bottom. They're exactly the same. The only difference that you're seeing is that you have a mobility map on top that blacks out the two center boxes and the two boxes below, are, the boxes below that essentially mirror the top, the center boxes um, have white speckles in them. And what you see, um, in terms of nomenclature at the bottom are the vehicle types. And what it's showing in terms of, in, in military terms, is a go-no-go -go opportunity. Where can military vehicles drive given the weight of the vehicle, the, the strength of the soil, and the moisture content, the saturation of the soil? Without SNAP data, the two center blocks on the top row are omitted completely. There's no opportunity for these two vehicles, the ATV and the transport truck, to pass through. However, when SMAP data was applied, the ATV and the transport truck did have opportunity for passing through areas. And this is from central Indonesia, but they're looking at areas in, in Korea and Afghanistan. And obviously, um, in data poor regions, it's very important to understand where your vehicles may get stuck based on weight and soil strength. So um, we have three groups within DOD working on this, and um, they've all teamed up to give a better understanding of soil moisture capabilities. And then we have Google creating, um, creating a tool. They are looking at source, an Earth Engine platform and using soil moisture as a layer. So when you go to Google Earth Engine, you can click on soil moisture and you'll have soil moisture from SMAP and it will tell you what the global soil moisture is. They're using the level two and level three products. And um, you will get an understanding for the global soil moisture and have that as, a, as an information tool moving down the road. Now, all of these early adopters and these applications are really um, being used to create case studies for the future. And the case studies that we're working on for the next two years are really example projects that help quantify the value, both scientific and societally, for, um, for SNAP. And we're doing that for the various categories. And so far, we've been able to improve the data services. We've been able to improve our tutorials and hands-on learning. This RSET webinar is, um, is something that we collaborate with RSET on, and we hope to you know, help inform people that want more information, give you hands-on opportunities for working with the data where the mission comes to you, and we work with your organization so you can apply SMAP products. Um, we have joint mission product opportunities where we look with, um, work with other organizations and other missions, like we work with ESA and SMOS, and we work with the carbon monitoring system. We work with ISAC2, um, who is also looking at early adopters. Um, and then we really take the lessons learned and move it up all the way up to NASA headquarters so this can be implemented um, organization-wide. And moving forward um, for the new decadal survey and the next 10 years of satellites that you're going to see, um, you will see applications as a formal program as a required just process. So early adopters and user feedback will begin at the very start of the mission, which is several years before launch. So 
your feedback, your contribution, your involvement with NASA missions is actually more important now than ever before because learning from you from the outside world and the outside perspective and the very fine scaled uses um, is only going to improve how NASA continues to do science. Um, SMAP started the, the trend and now it's um, because of the feedback and the great um, participation, it's moving forward and continuing. So uh, we always have application events, workshops, um, webinars, focus sessions to, um, to really invite more people to the programs and I extend that to everybody on the webinar. And really the common theme is, re is relationships. People think it's about science, but it's really about communication and leveraging the capabilities. So um, this is our team, and I have probably 30 seconds for questions. I apologize, I tried to leave more time. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for that excellent presentation.